Hey everyone, I'm Justin, creator of the Fabrication Series YouTube channel, and welcome to Weld Coach. You've probably guessed with all of this mess that I'm kind of busy, so I figured, you know what? One of my favorite episodes that I ever shot on TFS was a few years ago and it didn't do really well there, and maybe it'll do pretty good here. So if you have already seen it, thanks for watching it then, and if you haven't seen it yet, well, thanks for watching it now. I'm gonna go get a haircut and a shave so I look more presentable on the next episode. It's Weld Coach, your personal welding instructor, anywhere. This is one of my favorite topics to discuss. Do we or do we not ball the tungsten? Now the answer is so ridiculously convoluted because a whole lot has changed over the past three quarters of a century that we've been using AC TIG to weld aluminum. Now the main reason that we use AC on TIG welding is due to the uniqueness of the metal itself. Aluminum has a really cool ability to grow a protective shell around the outside when exposed to the atmosphere or the gases and air and stuff like that that we breathe in. That oxide layer is a protective barrier formed by the aluminum, but the problem is that it takes about twice the temperature to melt it as opposed to the internal layer, which presents a bit of a problem. Getting through that layer requires a significant amount of force that we usually only achieve on AC. In order to really understand this debacle of balling, we have to take a trip back to 1944, where the average worker made about $2,400 a year, a house would set you back about $3,500, and 150,000 Allied troops showed up to the beaches of Normandy. But a tiny piece of welding history was also born that year, and that was the introduction of AC for TIG welding. It was discovered that using both positive and negative polarity in a cycle would create the necessary power to remove or clean the oxide layer off the top before powering its way down into the core in order to stick it all together. It was revolutionary for the aluminum and magnesium welding process, but to put it lightly, it was insanely primitive because all we were given to use to weld something together was what came out of the wall. And for most of the world, that was a 60 hertz sine wave at 50-50 balance. Pretty difficult to work with. What makes aluminum so tricky is that you can't just fire a negative or a positive electrode polarity at it like you can in other types of welding because it has two different melting points. So if you were to fire at it with electrode negative, the internal or the core layer would melt away before the oxide layer does, which makes a, basically a big puddle of goo with like a film over the top of it. It's not possible to weld it that way, or at least it's not practical to weld it that way. You gotta get rid of the oxide layer. So if we went electrode positive on it, consider that your entire work surface is electrode electrified and all of that current is trying to get up into the tungsten or basically a big powerful fist just trying to blow it away and it's not going to withstand it. It can't. It obliterates everything but it does get hot enough to melt the oxide layer away which is partially why we need it. Now AC balance is the relationship of the positive wave to the negative wave in time, not amperage, but time. So a completely balanced wave at 50-50 means half the time the arc is trying to melt the tungsten, the other half the time it's trying to solidify the tungsten. The result is a big pesky ball that forms on the end of that tungsten. Now the ball was going to form on the end of the tungsten no matter what, we had no choice over it. So the common practice was to take a freshly ground piece of tungsten, load it up into the torch, and fire it off on a block of scrap metal until the ball was formed. The practice was known as balling the tungsten, which everyone did because we had no choice. The practice of balling held strong for a solid 30 years until the mid-1970s when Miller introduced the synchro wave with balance control. They pretty much said, hey, maybe we don't necessarily need all of that time on the positive trying to melt our tungsten away. What if we could only use it for just cleaning the oxide layer off? We reduce the amount of time that it spends on there and we'll apply it down to the negative side. The result of dropping the time spent on the positive was the tungsten keeping more of a taper on it which resulted in a more controllable arc, a deeper penetrating weld, and a more narrow profile. It was genius. However, at the time, 30 years had already gone by with the practice of balling, and with the sinker wave being an industrial machine and one of the first of its kind, well, the practice of balling carried for another couple of decades before it was more commonplace in machines that we use today. Now today, there are still thousands of machines in operation that are not equipped with balance control. That's why you see people still balling their tungsten. To them, they have to do it. That's why they'll tell you how to do it, and that's also why they'll tell you that you have to do it. But it's not necessarily true. If you have balance control on your machine, you probably don't even need to ball the tungsten at all. Now typically we set the machines around 30% positive to 70% negative on the balance control. Now each machine does have its sweet spot or where it operates best, but 30-70 will get you in the ballpark. 
At only 30% time on positive, you won't get much of a ball. You will see the tip round over slightly, but it will hold its taper instead of going full ball. The closer you get to 50-50 balance, the more likely you're going to see an actual ball forming on the end of it as opposed to a slight round over on a taper. And that means that you're going to have to fire it off on a block of scrap or something like that to do that. But the color of your tungsten also dictates the size of the ball. Now colors like green, blue, gray, stuff like that, they ball a little bit more than multi-mix colors like purple, pink, and chartreuse. But do you even want to ball the tungsten if you had the choice? The answer to that question is pure preference. Me personally, I am anti-ball. If I have a very large spherical shape on the end of the tungsten, that means that electricity taking the path of least resistance will grab wherever it feels like grabbing, meaning I have less control. But if I maintain a taper with a slightly rounded over tip, I can focus and refine that arc and shoot it wherever I actually want it to, meaning that I have more control out of it. So I don't ball my tungsten. I just fire it off and go. If you try to create a ball with, let's say, less than 40% positive, you're going to be there for a long time because it's not going to form. One more thing worth mentioning is that some manufacturers display the negative side of their adjustment, meaning that you don't adjust the positive side, you're adjusting negative, all the higher numbers. Now, the industry tale is that the uh, engineer over at Miller was dyslexic or screwed up, forgot to carry the one or whatever the case is, and that's what stuck on the display, so that's what everybody started using until the rest of the world said, well, that's not right, you're adjusting positive, not negative. So if you're not sure which one you have, it's very, very simple to identify it. Set the dial to 70. If the tungsten explodes, turn it to 30. So that is gonna wrap it up for this episode, and I really hope it takes some of the mystery out of balling the tungsten. Just remember that if you're set to about 30% positive and 70% negative, or significantly less than 50-50, you're not gonna see a ball. So please don't ask me why you're not getting a ball on your tungsten when your balance is offset like that. Thank you guys very much for watching. I'll see you guys on the next episode.